Well, I'd like to thank the organizers and particularly Peter Elliott and his family for the invitation and the opportunity to present our work here today. The title of my talk is Folate, Polymorphisms, and Down Syndrome, and we'll be looking at elements of maternal risk and a bit about uh, fetal survival. So I'd like to start out, uh, well, let me brace you up front. This is going to be quite mechanistically based, research-based talk. Um, that's what I do. Uh, I hope you'll find it uh, interesting and um, stimulate new thinking. So I'm going to start out by reviewing for you uh, pathways of folate metabolism and DNA methylation. And I want to do this up front because um, much of the basis for our hypothesis for non-disjunction has to do with the impact of abnormal folate metabolism on DNA methylation. And I'll be explaining that very carefully for you. So I think it's important that we start out up front because again, this is going to be heavily research-based and if you make that connection up front, I think it will all fall into place. Then I'll uh, give you our evidence for uh, possible um, abnormal folate metabolism in some mothers of children with Down syndrome and genetic polymorphisms in the folate pathway that may increase the risk of meiotic non-disjunction and having a child with Down syndrome. I'll then switch to the kids, which are equally interesting, and looking at their folate metabolism, which will, turns out to be quite different but complementary. Uh, and we have started a small, very modest uh, intervention trial with these children to try to normalize the abnormal folate profile that we see in the kids, and I'll show you that data. Uh, and then based on this, as I said, complementary interaction between the maternal folate abnormalities and uh, the abnormalities in the uh, children, which are basically based on the overexpression of cystothionine beta synthase. Um, I'll get a little more theoretical and discuss possible um, maternal fetal interactions that may actually uh, promote the survival of live-born children with um, Down syndrome. And then I'll end with um, a discussion of possible mechanisms for chromosome non-disjunction uh, associated with DNA hypomethylation and folate deficiency, and try to explain to you this interaction between folate deficiency, DNA hypomethylation, and non-disjunction. So I promised Peter I would make this simple, and I think uh, if you listen carefully, don't zone out on me, uh, you'll be able to follow. Um, so this is now I'm going to show you the relationship between folate, and here it is called tetrahydrofolate, um, folate and how it's related to DNA methylation. So this circle of arrows we call the methionine cycle, and it's driven by this very complicated but fascinating, if you're a biochemist, enzyme called methionine synthase. It's a B12-dependent enzyme, and it converts uh, homocysteine to methionine. This is actually a recycling or a conservation mechanism to keep methionine levels high. Well, this is our folate, and that is a methyl group, CH3, and this is a predominant form of folate in the uh, circulation, and it's called 5-methylfolate. So this Folate group then is transferred by, within this complicated enzyme, it's first transferred to B12, that makes methyl B12, and then the methyl group's transferred to homocysteine, all within this enzyme, and that regenerates methionine. Methionine is then activated to uh, a molecule called s methionine, or SAM, and this is important because it's the major methyl donor for a, a multitude of methyl transferation reactions, essential methylation reactions in the cell. And I'm going to be focusing only on DNA methylation for this talk. So the methyl group that's now derived from here, gone all the way through, it's now on this methyl donor, will transfer, the DNA methyl transferase will transfer that methyl group to cytosines in DNA. And there you have it. The methyl group started on 5-methylfolate, went around the cycle, the methyl transferase takes the methyl group from SAM and transfers it to cytosine. So when we talk about DNA methylation, we're really talking about cytosine methylation because that's where the methyl transferase puts the methyl group. Um, and the methylation of DNA is 
uh, important for a multitude of reasons, uh, uh, mechanisms, not only the confirmation of the DNA, which is what I'm going to focus on, but also uh, controls gene expression um, as well. So just continuing around the cycle, once SAM gives up its methyl group, it becomes acetinocyl homocysteine, which is then rapidly hydrolyzed to homocysteine, and the cycle goes round and round. It's present in every cell of the body. It's absolutely essential for cell viability and growth. So what happens now if we have folate or B12 deficiency, which can either be genetic or nutritional, what's going to happen is we're going to have less of this donating form, methyl donating form of folate. So when this is low, there's less flux through this methionine synthase reaction and through the whole um, methionine cycle. So clearly, if there's less methyl groups being donated, less flux, there's going to be lower methionine. Now here's where it gets a little more tricky. There's two substrates here um, for the methionine synthase reaction. So if this is reduced and methionine synthase flux is reduced, what happens to homocysteine is it actually increases simply because it's not being used. And this is a classic fig, um, a biomarker for folate or B12 deficiency. And it's for exactly this reason. It's not being used, so it, it accumulates in the plasma. So we see an elevation of homocysteine under conditions of folate or B12 deficiency. What happens when homocysteine increases is that this reaction reverses, and it's just the thermodynamics of the reaction. It happens uh, all the time, absolutely will happen when homocysteine goes up, the reaction reverses, and SAH goes up. This is important because, remember, this is the product. After SAM gives up its methyl group, it becomes SAH product. SAH is a potent product inhibitor because it's elevated, it inhibits, it binds to the active side of the enzyme and inhibits the methyl transferase. That is going to decrease the methyl groups that are being transferred to, meth to the DNA, uh, primarily during DNA synthesis. So we have an increase in the product inhibitor, which is going to decrease DNA methylation in general. We, because of the decrease in the cycle in this direction, the methyl donors decrease. So this is a setup. We have increase in the product, uh, which is inhibitory, a decrease in the precursor donor. We have reduced DNA methylation. So that's as far as I'm going to go, and I hope it's clear. The methyl groups start out on folate, end up in DNA, but under conditions of folate deficiency from both sides, we're going to end up with an inhibition of methylation, and this is called DNA hypomethylation. So, based on these uh, considerations, we hypothesized, and this was in uh, probably 1997, that DNA hypomethylation secondary to a folate deficiency, whether it be dietary or genetic, could increase the risk of meiotic non-disjunction in the mother, of course, and Down syndrome. And we focused on the mothers because clearly we all are aware that the non-disjunction event is maternal in 93% of the cases. And from the literature we know, or that from my literature research, it's clear that DNA hypomethylation, what we call global <laughs> hypomethylation, causes structural changes in the paracentromeric, that's around the centromere, which is important for normal chromosome segregation, and can induce um, non-disjunction or abnormal chromosome segregation. So this was our hypothesis going into um, the study. And let me just review for you again from the literature what are the potential consequences of DNA hypomethylation in this centromeric uh, region during meiosis. It's well established that most methyl groups on DNA are concentrated in this paracentromeric region. They're in this satellite repetitive elements. And so when there is a loss of methyl groups, it's happening there, primarily occurs in this region. So what will happen if there's less methyl groups, there'll be, the, there are many uh, proteins that will bind to that methyl group, and if they're not there, that's going to lead to something we call chromatin decondensation. The methyl binding proteins are responsible for keeping that chromosome and the DNA tightly coiled and condensed, which is important for normal segregation. With, with the methyl groups aren't there and the proteins can't bind, the DNA is in a much more open 
abnormal configuration that could cause does cause changes in the secondary structure, and many of the proteins that bind in the centromeric region rely on that structure. So if it's altered, that could affect um, proteins involved in the chromatid segregation. It could affect the ability of the homologs to pair or actually fail to pair. It can reduce recombination, cause tangling, abnormal segregation of the homologs or the sister chromatids. So that's just um, from the literature why this idea that DNA hypomethylation could contribute to um, abnormal chromosome segregation and um, non-disjunction. So again, so those considerations uh, were in our minds when we uh, began this very preliminary case control study that was published in 1999. And we looked at, again, based on these considerations, whether the moms compared to controls, the moms with children with Down syndrome had evidence of any abnormal folate metabolism. And we looked at uh, this particular polymorphism, MTHFR, <coughs> methylene tetrahydrofolate <coughs> reductase, um, at position 677, in most of us have C at that position, but some of us have a T. And that base pair substitution is associated with a decrease in the activity of that enzyme. And that would affect, as I'll show you, our, our pathway. So we started out with 57 cases, mothers, they were all Caucasian, uh, mean age was 31, and 50 controls. So we looked at the frequency of this polymorphism that is well known to affect the cycle that I've been um, discussing. We looked at their plasma levels of homocysteine and the SAH, that product inhibitor, because that was of interest to see if that was elevated then we might say that would be consistent with DNA hypomethylation. And then we also actually measured uh, DNA methylation uh, levels and related that to the homocysteine and the SAH levels. So this is where MTHFR, uh, this is the enzyme, um, that if you have a T at position 677, the activity, if you have one T, it's about 30%. If you have uh, both copies of the gene with a uh, thymine instead of a cytosine, it's a 50% reduction. So clearly, if you have this um, polymorphism in that enzyme, it's going to decrease the synthesis of this methyl donor, which is going to um, follow through and impact, at least this was our hypothesis, perhaps the methyl groups in uh, the DNA as well. So these are our results. Um, there are Three, this is the frequency in the mothers of children with Down syndrome and the controls. And there are three potential genotypes. Um, if you're CC, remember it's a cytosine to thymine uh, transition. If you're CC, that means you got a C from both parents. If you're CT at that site, um, one parent, uh, you got a T from one parent and a C from the other. If you're TT, and this is where you have the most reduction in enzyme activity, you got a T from both parents. So if we look at the relative uh, frequency in the Down, Down syndrome moms, 26% uh, had the normal genotype, whereas 48% of control, so significantly decrease in the normal genotype. What we call the heterozygote, 60% versus 44 in controls, significantly elevated. The homozygous mute or allele or homozygous variant, 14% versus 8%. So if we combine then one or both alleles, the odds ratio, and this means the likelihood that that combination or that allele would occur in a Down syndrome mom compared to a control mother was 2.6, and that was highly significant. So that was sort of scary, actually, but very, very interesting because this brought in a whole new aspect to, um, to possible mechanisms and risk uh, of, of Down syndrome. And it turned out to be, and still is quite controversial, but this, these were our results. We, this is the results of the homocysteine, which I actually find more interesting. So here are our two genotypes, the normal or one or both alleles affected with the T. Um, in the controls and in the mothers with Down syndrome. So clearly, the moms with Down syndrome had elevated homocysteine, which I remember I told you happens when there's a folate or B12 deficiency. It backs up because it's not being pumped through the cycle, so it, it, it goes up. 
So this was very interesting. But to me, what was particularly fascinating was the normal genotype for MTHFR also had elevated homocysteine. So this says something else is going on besides MTHFR. These moms have elevated homocysteine, but they have the normal genotype. So that said to us, MTHFR is interesting and important in some moms, but not all. And these are our results, again, looking at that backup product, the SAH, which is the inhibitor of the methyltransferase, comparing levels of SAH and this is in lymphocytes now, and um, the D level of DNA methyl methylation in the Down syndrome moms compared to control, and both were elevated. This clearly is not uh, oocytes, this is not the ovary, this is lymphocytes from the moms, um, so it's somewhat uh, uh, remote, but I think it provides a proof of principle that a folate deficiency does increase um, the homocysteine, the SAH, and the hypomethylation. So we concluded from this study that we didn't think that the MTHFR was an independent uh, risk factor, that the plasma homocysteine actually, this was this metabolic biomarker of abnormal folate metabolism, was much more consistently associated with risk than the polymorphism. And clearly there were other, there must be uh, other uh, mutations either in, in, the, in that pathway or def nutrient deficiencies that may increase the homocysteine and, and alter those pathways more frequently in mothers of children with Down syndrome. We followed that study with a larger case control study. Now we've got 157 moms and 140 controls. We're looking at the same polymorphism and NTHFR, but we add a new one, and I'll show you where that interacts. It does the same thing. It's, it's, a, it's a polymorphism that affects the cycling of um, the, in the methionine cycle. So I told you this is where MTHFR works. The T allele will reduce the activity, reducing the um, methylated folate, which is going to come back over here to the, to the DNA. The MTRR, this is called methionine synthase reductase. This is a very common polymorphism that's essential for B12 activity. In order for B12 to accept this methyl group, it has to be reduced in a reduced form. And this enzyme, uh, without making it any more complicated, um, is important to keep methionine synthase active. So that was a logical second choice to look, look for polymorphisms in the, in the moms. So this is our results then. Uh, we're looking at first the MTHFR and then the MTRR. It's the G allele in this case that's the variant allele. So again, in this much larger population, we saw a decrease, I'm sorry, an increase in the T allele frequency in the mothers of children with Down syndrome. But interestingly, the MTRR G allele frequency was even higher, the difference was even greater and the significance was greater, it seemed to be a stronger effect than the, um, the MTHFR. And this table will show you, uh, and this is actually quite interesting, the interaction between these two genotypes. And as we'll see, they actually interact together. This first line is what we call reference. Uh, the CC, remember, is the normal reference genotype. AA or AG genotype at position 66 in this gene was not associated with any increased risk. So this is our background reference. So in the second line, we're looking at those moms that had one or both alleles of MTHFR affected, but were normal for the MTRR. And if we look down here at the odds ratio, again, the likelihood that this combination would occur more often in mothers of Down syndrome compared to controls, we had an odds ratio of 2.37, which was significant. The third line shows those moms who had normal MTHFR, but had the homozygous variant in the MTRR, and again, we find that is much more likely to occur in mothers uh, with children with Down syndrome. And then the last line, which is the most interesting, is moms that had both. They had e both the T allele from MTHFR and the homozygous G from MTRR, and look what happens to the odds ratio, it's almost additive. So that was extremely exciting to see that these two polymorphisms that both affect the same pathway seem to uh, increase the risk even further. 
So from this study, then, we concluded that the second polymorphism was more strongly associated and that the combination of the two conferred a greater risk than either one alone. In this study, we did not have the homocysteine. We didn't have the biomarkers. We just had the DNA. So without that, uh, or had we had that, I think it would have been even uh, stronger. And again, these results, even though it's 150 sounds high, it's not. Uh, we really, to really nail this, you have to have very large population-based case control studies, which are very expensive, and so we, we have to rely on, on the small, affordable studies. And since that publication, um, there have been actually quite encouraging. I, I, it was really quite scary for me to publish this because it, it, it was um, quite controversial, so it's been very comforting to see that there have been a number, again, unfortunately, small studies that have associated um, MTHFR, there's a, actually a second polymorphism uh, that has been looked at. The methionine synthase enzyme has a polymorphism, the MTRR. Interestingly, they're never the same, uh, in, in the, and, it, and, it, and it shouldn't be. There's, there's not going to be a single polymorphism or a combination. But it's, what's interesting is that they're all involved in that pathway that affects uh, methylation. Several of them uh, also looked at the plasma homocysteine, which again, in my opinion, is the more important indicator of risk, would be an elevation in plasma homocysteine. Two French studies, an Italian study and a Turkish study, did not find an association between um, these polymorphisms and the risk of Down syndrome. Um, the French studies uh, acknowledged that the Mediterranean diet is very high in folate, and if you have a high folate intake, it really um, just obliviates the effect on, of the polymorphism. If you have high folate, the enzyme works fine. And so one of the explanations is that in some studies, it's the background genes, the population uh, genes, the diet. It's, when you're studying polymorphisms, it's very, very slippery, and, and you would never assume to find absolutely the same uh, polymorphisms in every study. So I think there's a lot more work to be done, but at least this is encouraging that maybe this pathway is important somehow in the risk of Down syndrome. So now let's switch to the kids. And as you probably all know, this en the um, enzyme or the gene, cystothionine beta synthase, or CBS, is one of the genes on tw 21 that has got three copies and is overexpressed. So now we're going to look at that same pathway, but it's going to be different. The dynamics are quite different because what's going to be shifting the pathway is the overexpression of CBS. We had 42 kids with uh, confirmed trisomy 21, and we had their siblings as our normal control, and we look at our metabolites. So here let me explain. Here's our CBS, and it's actually uh, homocysteine here is the precursor or the substrate for this enzyme, which will convert, actually catabolize, take cysteine out of this cycle completely and pull it down what we call the transsulfuration pathway. So if you have an overexpression of CBS, what's going to happen is it's literally sucking homocysteine down that pathway. It's competing <coughs> with my methionine synthase very well because it's got so much higher activity. So if homocysteine then, we would hypothesize, would be decreased and its product, cystothionine, should go up. And it's been shown, actually, that the activity and the expression of CBS is one of the genes on 21 that has been documented to be increased. So if homocysteine is being pulled down this pathway, the rest of the metabolites are also just being pulled down this pathway. What's going to happen then, for the opposite reason, is less homocysteine available, there's going to be less flux through this methionine synthase reaction, which is only going to pull these metabolites down further. In this case, what happens when the methionine synthase reaction is not, beaten, is not pulling homocysteine through is that folate actually builds up. And that's because, again, it's, Homocysteine is going in this direction, less is going in this direction, so the co-substrate isn't being used, so it accumulates. And this is called something called the folate trap. And it can be very misleading because folate levels in the kids and even B12 levels in the kids can be elevated, but it's not because they're folate adequate, it's because it can't get through this, 
the cycle. It can't get through the enzyme to make active folate. So this folate trap has been hypothesized to be an important part of um, metabolism in children with Down syndrome. So now let's look at our results. Here's our control kids, and this are the, these are the uh, metabolites in our pathway. And we're looking at homocysteine, which I said is being pulled down that pathway, and we did see, I actually thought it would be more than this, but a decrease in the homocysteine levels. The methionine levels were quite significantly reduced, again, because it's not being synthesized. It's not going through that pathway. So we saw a decrease in methionine. The product of CBS, which is overexpressed, was increased. I think this is the first demonstration of actually the product itself being so uh, much increased in the kids. The next step down from cystothionine is cysteine, which was also quite elevated. Interestingly, the next step down from cysteine is glutathione, with GSH. And glutathione, as you may well be aware, is the major intracellular antioxidant. It's absolutely essential for detoxification and for ant uh, quenching of free radicals we found that the glutathione levels were significantly decreased, and that may have to do with the increase in free radicals um, secondary to the superoxide dismutase, which is also on chromosome 21. Um, at any rate, uh, it may be that it's down because it's, it, there's a greater need in the kids for this antioxidant capacity. So from this study, we concluded that the increase in the CBS activity um, led to the decrease in plasma homocysteine and uh, the increase in cystothionine and cysteine levels. And we think that the reduced cysteine, I'm sorry, the reduced homocysteine would suggest that that methionine synthase, that central enzyme, is uh, the flux through that enzyme is reduced, and that would promote this folate trap. It can't, the folate now can't get through, and this we call a functional folate deficiency. And just uh, hypothesizing the, a functional folate deficiency in these children, secondary to the trap, the fact that it can't get through anymore, may underlie the increased uh, mean, mean corpuscular volume, the methotrexate sensitivity, and the increased risk of leukemia in these children. And that's just very hypothetical, but at least it's consistent. Our next uh, experiments, um, were given that abnormal profile, you can order trisomy 21 cell lines from uh, Coriel uh, cell repositories. We ordered um, trisomy 21 lymphoblastoid cell lines, and we cultured them in media that was adequate but not excessive in folic acid and methionine. And then we added um, nutrients that were designed to try to up the methionine and up those uh, metabolites that were um, reduced in the kids. And then we harvested them and measured the uh, metabolites to see the effect of these uh, additions. So this is the results when we added methionine. And uh, the 100% was the baseline where the cells started. This is intracellular now. This is not plasma. Um, where they were when they started, um, I'm not showing you, but the intracellular levels of these metabolites were very similar to what we had seen in the plasma. So it was quite interesting that we, by adding methionine, we were able to crank up and pump up that methionine cycle, which was very encouraging. We also added a, this is the cofactor form of B12, uh, methyl B12. Again, it seemed to crank up and push through that cycle that was so um, depressed or, or, or low in terms of these uh, metabolites. We also added folinic acid. Um, this was to support the folic acid side, and it tended to, again, stimulate that pathway. So this was very encouraging. And so based on this ability, at least in cells in vitro, to, to be able to improve um, or, or crank up this pathway, that suggested maybe we should try nutritional intervention in the children and try to normalize um, the, the, the levels that were so reduced. So this, and again, this is a very modest trial compared to uh, what's happening here in the UK. Our hypothesis then was that this CBS, that the uh, enzyme on trisomy 21, that its overexpression will decrease the homocysteine and methionine and possibly increase their nutritional requirement for methionine. 
Our objectives were to determine whether, and I chose folinic acid and betaine, and I'll explain that in a moment, it's called trimethylglycine. Uh, our, our, our objective was to try to up the, up the homocysteine so we could up the methionine and up the glutathione levels. Um, again, this, our study is purely biochemical because I'm not a physician. It would be wonderful to have the funding to look to see whether improving the metabolism would also improve um, their, their function in, in some way. But this, again, just to remind you, we're just looking at the biochemistry. Uh, so we then measured the levels before and after supplementation with the, we used 500 milligrams of uh, betaine and 400 micrograms of folinic acid every day for three months. And we hope to have 30 children, two to 10 years of age. So this early results are just, um, we have an N of 13 at this point. So betaine, or trimethylglycine, uh, is an alternate uh, pathway to increase methionine. So that's how we, why we chose that. The folinic acid is a reduced form of folic acid that can help the folate uh, uh, metabolites that are important for DNA synthesis. So that was just a, uh, an educated guess uh, to use those two, um, based on our, our metabolic profile, um, to use those two. And so let me show you where folinic acid comes in. It's a reduced form of folic acid that will um, leads to an increase in, this is the other uh, function of folate, is the nucleotides, uh, the synthesis of the adenine, the guanine, and the thymidylate for DNA synthesis. So folinic acid was added to support DNA synthesis. And this is where the betaine adds, there, uh, acts. There's an enzyme called betaine homocysteine methyltransferase that does exactly the same thing as MS. It converts homocysteine to methionine, but it's completely independent of the B12 and folate. So that was a good choice to try to get the methionine levels up. So here again, we're just started. We've got um, a ways to go, but the, it's quite encouraging, I think, um, that the, and I believe it's the betaine that, that, that's doing the increase in methionine. We didn't see much of a change in homocysteine, but a quite nice increase after uh, three months uh, on these supplements, uh, increase in the mean level of methionine. Uh, didn't see much change in the methyl donor SAM. Interestingly, and uh, I'm not really sure I understand it, but adenosine and SAH were elevated to start with, and the, this is the methyl in, inhibitor, um, but afterwards they came down to, and these are in the normal range. So, that was quite encouraging. We seem to normalize uh, the abnormalities uh, with this intervention. And now, now we're looking at the glutathione, which I think is the most important, um, because glutathione is so important to, uh, for, for uh, cell function, for um, redox potential, for the activity of enzymes, um, for, uh, for, for, for antioxidant uh, defense of free radicals, for detoxification of environmental, it's a critical molecule. Um, before, uh, it was low and increased quite significantly after three months. This is total. That uh, means protein-bound glutathione as well as the free. If we just look at the free, which is the active, it was low and increased somewhat uh, that was significant. Um, GSSG is the spent form of glutathione. It's a uh, disulfide form. It's given up its hydrogens. It's inactive and needs to be regenerated. It was uh, quite high in the children to start with and came down. This is not quite to normal, but it, it's in the right direction. The ratio, this ratio is called the redox ratio, was significantly increased. So this, again, is encouraging. Uh, this, which this is just at the beginning, and so these are very, very tentative, but at least this uh, mechanism-based uh, intervention uh, seems to be going at least in the right direction. What, it was, what this all is says is that kids with um, Down syndrome would likely be more sensitive to what we call pro-oxidant environmental exposures. That's the heavy metals, um, anything that, would, that glutathione is responsible for detoxifying, they will be more sensitive. It also suggests that acetaminophen is probably not a good thing to give to children with Down syndrome because it's known to block the pathway to glutathione synthesis. So why add insult to injury? And this is, again, just um, my observation, but it, it wouldn't make sense not to use acetaminophen in these kids. This was an unexpected and kind of very interesting, be interesting to see whether the UK trial um, has something similar. This is, again, just three months. Um, 
we saw a two centimeter increase in height in these children in three months time, and that was totally unexpected. And I suspect it's the methionine going up because that's protein synthesis, and I su suspect it's the folinic acid treating the DNA synthesis side. Something worked to increase um, their growth, and that was, again, totally unexpected. It was just part of the hi history and physical that was done. Okay, so now um, I wanna sh show you an interesting phenomenon, which is the interaction between what I've been telling you occurs in the moms and because of the uh, MTHFR polymorphism, those mothers, not all mothers, but the mothers that have a problem with folate metabolism, and the children who have the CDS overexpression. Could this interaction actually promote the survival? And it's just an interesting exercise. Um, so for, for the kids, uh, I told you that the CBS is overexpressed which is gonna increase uh, the product and decrease the homocysteine. Well, when you decrease the homocysteine, I told you that's gonna interrupt the flow through this pathway and promote DNA hypomethylation. On the other side of the CBS, we have the folate trap, which means because of the low homocysteine, it's not going through and it builds up. That is, if, if, if there's less flux through and this, increases, then the products on this side are gonna decrease, and I'm sort of snuck this in on you, but this, this molecule, which is the substrate for MTHFR, um, is very, is a pivotal, because it, if it goes this way, it makes thymidylate for DNA synthesis. If it goes this way, it makes the nucleotides, uh, adenine and guanine deoxynucleotides. So we're gonna have a decrease in DNA synthesis, and I, I Forget all the arrows, but I want you to focus on the fact that with CBS overexpression, as I've explained, homocysteine will be low, but on the flip side of the folate, we're gonna have a decrease in this uh, critical molecule that's important for nucleotide synthesis and DNA synthesis. So this is the scenario with overexpression of CBS. Down arrow, down arrow. Okay, now we look at the T allele. Well, remember, this enzyme isn't working as well with the T allele, so its precursor, the one that goes on for DNA synthesis, builds up. This is all kind of like, think of it like plumbing. If it's not going through this pipe, it's gonna build up on the upside, and it's gonna decrease on the downside. So the T allele actually causes an up arrow here, and because the flux is not going through from this side, homocysteine builds up. So what is that we've got? two up arrows in these two critical molecules for DNA methylation, oops, DNA methylation and DNA synthesis. So this is the mom, and remember, this is the kid with the CBS overexpression where the homocysteine and the, the uh, methylene tetrahydrofolate are down. So they're complementary. So if you put them together and say that the, the child with Down syndrome had the T allele as well as the mom, what would we anticipate in that child with the overexpression of CBS? Well, it turns out the elevated homocysteine in the mom, that homocysteine crosses the placental uh, membranes, so that it may be that the increased homocysteine in the mom could actually compensate for the low homocysteine in the child and upregulate the cycle and increase DNA methylation. And with the, if they both have MTHFR, this is going to build up, which is going to promote a more uh, effective DNA synthesis. So based, again, this is very theoretical, but we decided, well, let's look and see, does the T allele, is it transferred more frequently to, and again, these are live-born uh, children with Down syndrome. And again, this is, this is our uh, hypothesis that this combination could compensate, the maternal homocysteine could compensate for the low fetal, and the increase in this could support error-free DNA synthesis, which could support the survival of this child with the overexpression of CBS. So this is our study then, looking to see whether um, the T allele occurs more frequently than we would expect in the live-born children with Down syndrome. So if you just base, and you can, this is all statistics, but you, based on Mendelian genetics, you would expect um, 88 of our population, uh, we should have seen 88 T alleles expected. We actually saw 106, which was significant. So there was a significant, in live born, more T alleles and less C alleles. 
And then if we look at the genotypes in MTHFR in the children, this is what we would have expected of the normal. We actually saw less of the TT. We would have expected 22.7, and we actually saw 27. And again, this is very hypothetical, but it's kind of an interesting, um, if you're a biochemist, uh, way to look at the complementary metabolisms, uh, abnormal in both cases, but perhaps um, complementary. We know that 80% of trisomy 21 conceptions result in pregnancy loss, and it's not clear to anyone whether the survival of this minority, it's only a minority of the fetuses that actually are born, whether it's a selective advantage or whether it's just uh, a chance event. And based on our data, we hypothesize that this preferential transmission of the T allele uh, may reflect a metabolic advantage in the context of the CBS overexpression. So now in the final few minutes, I want to uh, just review for you how the abnormal folate metabolism uh, may, uh, may affect uh, chromosome segregation. As I uh, mentioned earlier, um, it's the repetitive elements around the centromere, what we call paracentromeric DNA, that normally are hypermethylated. And it's important that they're hypermethylated because that keeps the, the chromosomes and the DNA condensed so that it can align properly and pair properly. Um, if there's a loss of DNA of methyl groups in that area, it's associated, as I said, with this opening or decondensed de chromatin structure, and this can affect the methyl binding protein and, secondarily, the, the uh, segregation. This, these were kind of, this was experiments we did in mice and rats. Now I'm getting a little closer. We were looking at lymphocytes. Now we're looking at ovaries. Um, in this study, it's actually a genetic uh, MTHFR knockout mouse, and we're looking at DNA methylation levels with, this is the CC, the CT, and the TT. And in the ovaries, with the, meth with the knockout mouse that, that does this enzyme does not work, we see an elevation in DNA hypomethylation, which is consistent with our, with our hypothesis. And then on the right side, we, at, we took uh, Fisher 344 rats and fed them a deficient diet, a folate deficient diet, and we're looking at centromeric um, hypomethylation, and as early as three weeks, um, there is a significant increase or a loss of methyl groups in the centromeric region. So this is now getting a little closer than we were with the plasma and the lymphocytes. I'm sure you're all familiar with this, um, the non-disjunction mechanisms, M1 and M2. Uh, I wanted to just remind you that normal um, Chromosome segregation depends on uh, this uh, recombination events that's important for the tension and the alignment uh, of, of the uh, chromosomes during the long uh, prophase where it's latent. Um, and then in M M1, as you know, there is an abnormal uh, M1 segregation where they both go to the one pole and end up with two. In an M2 a non disjunction, there's a failure of the sister chromatids uh, to separate. Okay. There's another mechanism that's receiving more, or recently, more research interest, and it's called premature centromeric uh, division, or PCD, of the sister chromatids in M1. And it occurs um, more often in what we call achiasmatic homologs where there is no crossover so that the, the tension, the holding together of the, of the chromosomes, the duplicated uh, homologs, uh, is less um, uh, strong. So the idea is that then without that recombination that there could be a loss of cohesion in the centromeric region, the sisters separate and then there's a random migration to one or both poles that could lead to aneuploidy. So it's a little different, very different from non-disjunction. Um, it uh, occurs in a, a rare syndrome called Robert syndrome. Uh, it occurs in aging uh, with the X chromosome. It occurs in cancer cells. So the question is, could this also be involved in um, the trisomy 21? Well, this is a, um, a slide of uh, oocytes in M2. This is the work of Rosalind Angel uh, in early 1990s. And these are um, 
oocytes that are left over from in vitro fertilization. They're not optimal, but she's looking at the chromosomes. And what was of particular interest, and, and she proposed this uh, premature centromeric uh, division, is that instead of non-disjoined chromosomes that went to the same pole, what she's seeing is single sisters, single, single uh, chromatids that would be consistent with this um, premature centromeric division. This is a um, slide of bone marrow cells, uh, metaphase spread way back when they used to do that. This is an old, old paper um, of an individual with folate deficiency and megaloblastic anemia. And it's absolutely striking what's going on in the centromere. Normally where there's the constriction at the centromere, there is, they call it centromeric spreading or centromeric repulsion, where at the centromere they're actually separated. And there's several examples of that. And this is bone marrow cells. And then in this slide, these are normal lymphocytes that were cultured in folate thymidine deficient media or normal media. So this is the normal media. This is the same lymphocytes under folate deficient conditions. And look, it's got these funny spreading uh, repulsed uh, centromeres. It's, it's fascinating. And again, these are old studies before molecular biology, um, but I was struck by, by this abnormal um, configuration. So on these last slides, I'll, I'll, you have to bear with me, but this, this, this is really quite interesting. Um, what I'm, this is a gel, and what we do, what we did here, we're trying to look to see if um, there could be uh, DNA hypomethylation. And the way we did it was you have to do these things kind of um, indirectly because we can't get there directly. What we did is we isolated the DNA from uh, human folate deficient lymphocytes. We made them folate deficient, isolated the DNA, and we treated them with this enzyme that'll make a cut. It'll break the DNA if it's hypomethylated at that site. So we, we, treat the, we isolate the DNA, we treat it, it cuts if it's hypomethylated, and then we, do, we amplify that region. And this is the um, uh, AFL satellite repeats. We have primers for that region. They're similar between 21, 13, and 16, so we couldn't do it just for 21. So we amplify that region with PCR. Well, if there breaks, the PCR product is dramatically reduced. And that's basically what I'm showing you here, is that we got much less PCR product after we treated with this enzyme. So it's an indirect way to show that, that there was more hypomethylation in the folate deficient alpha satellite. Now we're getting even closer. We're looking at the alpha satellite region. In this experiment, uh, you take nuclei, and we're looking at for the condensation. This is a way we, 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 we went to address that issue. Um, you take the nuclei from uh, folate deficient uh, lymphocytes and you treat it with an enzyme called micrococcal nuclease. And this is uh, the micrococcal nuclease uh, accessibility assay. If the chromatin in this region, the alpha satellite region around the centromere, is decondensed and open, then that enzyme can get in and cut. If it's condensed the way it's supposed to be, it won't get in and it won't cut and you're going to have more PCR product. So basically, without going into a lot of detail, lane three here, and we have counts, is the, shows that the, um, the micrococcal nuclease got in, it cut, and we had less PCR amplification because there were too many breaks. So this is an indirect way to show that there was a decondensed chromatin, because again, the only way it could get in there and cut was if it was open. And then finally, this is a very neat assay. It's called chromatin immunoprecipitation, or CHIP assay. What you do is you take chromatin, which is the DNA with the protein still on it, and you add an antibody to a protein that would be bound to that DNA. And we looked at a methyl binding protein, and we looked at a methylated um, histone. Lysine 9 is a, is a methylated histone, which is important, again, methylated histones involved with this condensed, so we're trying to look molecularly at the configuration uh, in the alpha satellite region. And what we're showing, again, is, well, this is complicated, but what you do is you expose uh, to the antibody, you precipitate that DNA that has the antibody on it, and then you uh, look for the, the amount of DNA, which will be only the DNA that had the antibody. And you can see there was much less MECP2 and the methylated cytosine in the folate deficient cells, which means there was less 
less protein. <clears throat> so we can conclude then that the folate deficiency was associated with reduced MECP2 and reduced methylation of the histone. And this was exciting to us, believe it or not. <laughs> we thought this was pretty cool. Um, let me just get a of water here. I'm almost through. So just to summarize with all those um, slides and bands, what we showed very indirectly is that in the alpha satellite repeats, in human lymphocytes under folate deficient conditions, we showed that the alpha satellites were hypomethylated, that the results were consistent with centromeric decon decondensation and reduced binding of these two uh, of the methyl binding protein and the histone that are both associated with um, decondensation. And then we were, I've been very comforted to see actually two pa very recent papers that again seem to support our wild <coughs> ideas way back in 1997. Um, Wang et al. Uh, published a paper uh, in 2004, folate deficiency induces aneuploidy in human lymphocytes with probes specifically specific for chromosomes 17 and 21. Bistra et al. Folate deficiency increases chromosome instability, chromosome 21 aneuploidy, and radiation induced micronuclei, 2005. So, again, we may be on to something uh, that certainly needs a lot more work and, and con confirmation, but I think is quite exciting. So, we've now expanded our hypothesis um, that folate deficiency and or genetic polymorphisms that affect this pathway may promote regional hypomethylation in centromeric DNA and the histones, resulting in local destabilization of the chromatin structure, premature centromeric division, and abnormal chromosome segregation. And then I'd like to end, uh, as a biochemist, <clears throat> with some recommendations for mothers who may have already have a child with Down syndrome uh, or in the family or are concerned uh, about the risk of having a child with Down syndrome. As I said, the best indicator of a problem with these pathways that we've been walking through is plasma homocysteine greater than 8.5. For adult females, it should be between 6 and 8. So I would recommend prenatal, I mean three plus months before conception, checking their homocysteine levels. Um, if they're elevated, they're very easily reduced. So to minimize the risk, the homocysteine should be checked. I, I absolutely believe that. I mean, it can't hurt. It's, a, it's common because elevated homocysteine is a risk factor for heart disease, for Alzheimer's, for dementia, for a lot of things. So it's not an expensive test. And uh, as again, I said, it's easy to bring down. For, um, patients, and this is all known because of its association with heart disease and renal failure and um, uh, Alzheimer's and dementia, one to two milligrams of folate per day plus 500 micrograms of B12 and 50 milligrams of B6. I didn't show you, but B6 is a cofactor in that uh, pathway to glutathione. Will normalize um, the homocysteine levels in the vast majority of, of people, and it sh again, it should be six to eight, seven to eight micromoles per liter. If for any reason it doesn't come down, add that trimethylglycine or the betaine, which was the alternate pathway uh, to bring up um, it, that will bring that homocysteine back into the pathway if it's stuck and elevated. And also, um, as a biochemist, and I, I, I can't go into this, but I think choline supplementation would also be important for phosphatidylcholine or uh, lecithin synthesis, which, and I didn't go to, is methylation dependent. So if you have a problem with the homocysteine, if it's elevated, the SH is going to go up and you're going to have methylation problems, not only in DNA methylation, but phospholipid methylation. So choline, again, would be uh, an interesting, um, and it certainly is not going to hurt. Uh, supplement for, for um, mothers that are they're contemplating a second pregnancy. So just to then conclude, these are our collaborators. Um, this is at uh, UAMS, um, and we collaborated, uh, this is when I was, we did the original work when I was at the FDA uh, National Center for Toxicological Research, and we uh, collaborated with um, <coughs> Stephanie Sherman at, at, at Emory and Rima Rosen in Montreal. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope you didn't fall asleep. <laughs>